So, hello everybody, how are you? Um, my name is Jonathan, I'm a product manager and a user experience expert. Um, I've done, over the past 10 years, I've helped to build many products in various uh, industries from e-commerce to social networks, messaging apps, uh, cybersecurity products, uh, a wide range of stuff uh, for startups and for enterprises. Um, uh, I've had an uh, opportunity to experience a nice range, but most people don't know about me that before that, about 15 years ago, I started out as a full-time artist. I was a painter. I exhibited my paintings all over the, not all over the world, but in some places in the world, in Brussels, in London, in Hong Kong, in the United States, here in Tel Aviv, of course. Um, and I was pretty successful at it too. I, I've sold quite a few paintings, but I wasn't satisfied. I felt that I'm not making the impact that I want to make. So I turned to technology and I decided to launch a startup without having a clue at what I'm doing. And uh, I convinced who else but my friends and family to give me some money. Um, because obviously nobody wanted to, to give the first role to an artist. Nobody, nobody wanted to give me a job actually. So this is why I went to create my first startup. And one of the first thing we did was to hire a lawyer, right? Somebody to, to take care of our uh, legal matters. And it turned out, as it often turns out with lawyers, that the bills we ended up receiving were much, much higher than what we expected. And very soon, we found out that we we're about to lose all the money of our friends and our family. And I ran out to the market and tried to fix meetings and schedule meetings with anybody who was ready to talk with us. Any VC or any investor that was ready to meet me, I was there. But the, the answer I got from all of them, al almost all of them, from 16 investors was a constant no. And they were right in a way. It was my first time, uh, uh, no, uh, no track record, and we didn't know the competitors well enough. We actually, we didn't know what we we're getting ourselves into. But then came the crucial week that I knew that if we're not getting new money in, that's the end, it's over. There were three more investors on the pipeline that I was supposed to meet the same week. And here I wanna ask you guys, what do you think I can do at that point in order to increase the chances to get a yes from one of those th remaining three? So 16 times no, three more to go. What can I do at that point to increase the chances to get a yes? Come on, give me your ideas. Something different, great, more. Help? Okay. Okay, great. Something should be different for sure. Yeah. Hmm, that's nice. More. Didn't hear that? Hmm, guilt trip. That's good. Okay, great, great. Um, an idea that I had at that point was to to invite all three of them to the same place at the same time. So I rented the Hilton um, uh, meeting room in uh, Tel, Aviv, Tel Aviv, uh, and I invited all of three of them at the same place at the same time. I thought that if it would seem like there's a high demand to invest in us, that would might drive one of them to do so. And they were very surprised, and at that point I didn't need to do anything different because I didn't need to talk at all. They just spoke to each other, and, uh, and uh, we actually we got a yes at the end. But I'm not telling you this story because of that. I'm telling you this story because it sent me on a research, on a mission that took me about 10 years and still no answers, no final answers. And this is the question. Why didn't I see it before? Why did, did I need to get 16 times no in order for the brain, which is the same brain, to give me my winning solution? And this blew my mind. So I started to look deeper into it. Why there are some moments 
that our brain gives us its best, but other moments when we need it also, we don't get it. We don't get the maximum capacity of our brain all the time. How can it be? So let's look at some examples. In the late 1880s, 1980s, two struggling comedians wanted to create a comedy show, right? And we all know this comedy show. Um, they started out, they wanted to create a 90-minute show and about how comedians write jokes. But then, only then, uh, when they ran out into a dead end, they actually came up with a concept of a 10-minute turnaround. Of, excuse me, of they came up with a concept of a show about nothing, which became Seinfeld. Or let's look at Samsung. You pro probably are wondering why I'm saying Samsung and showing noodles, but Samsung started out as a noodles company. It was only after the company assets were buried under the ashes of the Korean War that they reinvented themselves as the company we know today. Um, Southwest Airlines, they were losing money. And it was only at that point that they were struggling to survive that they came up with a concept that they called the 10 minute turnaround, which meant that the plane had to land, prepare the plane, onboard new passengers, all in 10 minutes, 10 minutes only. And this actually gave the shift and that, that helped them become the most successful uh, low cost airline today in the United States. The Instagram founders, they started out with a different product called Bourbon. And it was only after they launched the product that they realized that nobody was uploading photos, that nobody was checking in like they, like they were supposed to do. People were just uploading photos like crazy. And that's how they came across the concept of Instagram. And I heard Kevin Systrom say in one podcast, something that I brought for you because it demonstrates my point. He said, initially, our bet was on location, but I'm just very happy we discovered this image thing along the way. Wow, you know, we, we often hear these kind of sentences from successful founders and we're like, wow, what a lucky guy, you know? He just billion dollar ideas just drop into his head effortlessly. You know, uh, he probably meditates every morning and, and uh, this kind of guy, it just happens to him. And I think that looking at it that way is misleading because we start to think, okay, what do we need to do in order to get just a tiny bit of his luck? So first thing we do is sticky notes, right? We need to sh show we were thinking and being creative so we fill the room floor to ceiling with sticky notes. And if you go to Google and we, uh, and we Google uh, uh, brainstorming, then we get tons of sticky notes and tons of sketches. And this is what we do. But then it's very hard to converge from that. It's easy to put out ideas. It's very hard to narrow down. So then we say, OK, no, we need to do a completely different activity. Uh, we probably need to do something more uh, that will come from deep deep from our souls, something artistic. Let's bring a canvas and uh, start to paint. And maybe doing this activity, which is different, the miracle will happen. But it doesn't work either. And then we say, OK, I know what's the problem. The office is the problem, OK? The walls are the problem. That's why we're not uh, getting our best ideas. So we need an offsite. And I've actually been in an offsite that they took us to the Jordan River and we had to float on surfboards and brainstorm while, while we were doing that. <laughs> okay, and guess what? People just fell in the water. Nothing happened. So uh, what interests me in this sentence, what gets my attention is actually this part. Along the way. The actual work we put in along the way, along the process might be that the work itself is the most powerful mechanism of all those mechanisms and all those tools that we read every day in blog posts and whatnot. Work itself, because if Seinfeld would not have to work and rework the script, they wouldn't come with across, a, uh, they wouldn't come up with a concept of a show about nothing. If Samsung wouldn't have to work their way out of a crisis, they would probably not reinvent themselves as the company we know today. Southwest Airlines had to work hard to survive and only then the spark came. And same with Instagram, right? You know how hard it is 
to understand how users are actually using your product. So, so that's when it came for them. And it's not only them. Research says that 70% of successful companies today ended up succeeding with something they didn't originally start with. This is an amazing thing, okay? They started up with one thing and ended up succeeding with something they come, uh, came up with along the way. But it's, it's not just work. It's not just how much we work. It's actually how we work. Because if we look at the common conditions they all faced and describe it with one word and one word only, that would be uncertainty. So the question is this, what if feeling uncertain is not an obstacle like it actually feels? What if it's actually an accelerator that helps us to reach our best potential, our best thinking potential, our best ideas, our best solutions? And I believe there is something to it. And what if we can take it one step further? What if we could control it and generate it in our daily work? Because usually, and, and uh, luckily, we don't confront such extreme situations uh, in our daily work, right? So what if we could simulate and make, make our brains think that now is the time? Now is the time, give me your best idea right now, okay? And, and today, what I like to do is to share three tactics with you in order to bring uncertainty into our work. We understand that uncertainty is good, but there's still a very, very big problem. And the problem is that every inch of our body, every inch of our mind is fighting for the complete opposite, right? We want certainty, we want the familiar. And it makes sense because once we figure out how to do something, we lose interest in improving. Okay, we go from zero to one and okay, now I know how to do it. So what we really need is we need habits to push, to push us into uncertainty on purpose because otherwise we don't go there. And we understand that we wanna be there. We wanna take as many decisions as possible from this state of mind, from this emotional state. I wrote a book about this, it's called The Other Ideas. And I published it a year ago, but no worries, I'm gonna tell you all about it. Nobody's gonna have to read anything. Um, so three habits I'd like to share with you to bring uncertainty into our daily work in order to accelerate our uh, brain power. So the first one would be to limit your superpower. But wait a minute, what's a superpower and how can I limit it? So this, our superpower is this one thing we all have that we can do in the middle of the night with our hands behind our backs. Okay, something that brought us until this point. And it can be something very, superpower is a fancy word, but it can be something very, uh, uh, it, it doesn't need to be fancy, it can be very modest. It can be as creating a spreadsheet, it can be making a presentation, it can be creating a marketing, uh, slogan, it can be uh, creating humor in, in, in a product, anything that comes natural to us that we've been doing for a long time. And the catch is that when I ask most people, when did you make a big leap in this area of yours? Most people tell me a long time ago. So what's happening here? The thing we're very good at is the same thing we're afraid to touch, right? Because if we know that people applaud each time we do it, then why change? Okay, we're afraid to change it. And I've seen colleagues that were afraid to make this leap in this area that, that they're so good at and, uh, and gradually went out of the game and, uh, and, lo and lost very meaningful opportunities. So think about it, what is it for you? What is this one thing for you that you're good at and you, you, and, and, and you avoid taking a li big leap in. For me, for example, it's wireframing. And I've been doing this for many years. So what I do today is actually I limit this superpower. I force myself 
to, to use only two or three templates, even if 50 or 60 templates are needed. So even somebody very experienced says, oh, that's why, why did I get myself into this project? Um, so th that does it for me in this area. But there are many more examples. A, a very talented designer who attended one of my workshops, he, his superpower is to create amazing illustrations with vibrant colors and um, uh, really eye-catching. And he decided to limit this superpower of his and to use only one color. Okay, one color only. And he called me up and he told me that because he needed to create a beautiful illustration with one color, it took him to a completely new design language. Or an HR partner I worked with, she, she, after 20 years, she stopped reading CVs before going into an interview. Okay, and then she was amazed how her brain comes up with new questions to understand who is sitting in front of her. So it's a very powerful thing. And her superpower doesn't need to be a skill. It can also be a resource. If we look at Wikipedia, for example, th ironically, they, their very best feature, which became their scalability engine, the fact that each and every one of us can edit anything in Wikipedia anytime, wasn't just an idea that it popped into a genius CEO's mind. Actually, this CEO tells a different story. He says, he says that this idea came up this because they simply didn't have money. They couldn't hire professional editors, so the uncertainty it brought led them to engage the community, which gave them the power and the scalability they have today. You see, there is a very interesting relationship between the resources we have and the uncertainty we need to face. Because the more resources we have, the less uncertainty we, ha we need to face, right? We have everything, time and money, endless. But since we understand that creativity is inside uncertainty, what this graph really means is that when resources go down, creativity goes up. And this is exactly the essence of what we want to do here with limiting our superpowers. There are research made in, the, in, recent, year, in, in recent years that show that most of the time we're not thinking. We're on autopilot. They scanned people's brains and they see zero activity for 95% of the time. The trigger that tells the brain to switch on is when we're confronted with new information. But it doesn't happen often enough. So we need to make sure we confront ourselves with new information and improvise, give ourselves a chance to improvise our way out. And this is, one one, this is what we want to do with this habit. And before I go to my second one, I want to talk about Miles Davis. Miles Davis, you know him? Anybody like jazz? Okay, great trumpeter. Um, anybody who likes jazz admires Miles Davis. In 1959, he recorded an album called Kind of Blue, a flagship album in the world of jazz. Let's listen to the first piece, and then we'll talk about it. 20 seconds. Nice, right? Um, what most people don't know is that it was supposed to sound completely different. The drummer, the entrance of the drummer needed to be so smooth, and actually the cymbal was barely supposed to be heard. And also, the drummer came in too early, so there was a mistake there. So what, we see, what, what do we see musicians do when this kind of stuff, ha stuff happens? They say, that's in jazz, baby. <laughs> but not always, it's, re it's a recording. Usually they say, no, 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 roll it back. Give it to me the way I wanted, the, the way I imagined it. But what Miles Davis did, he burst in with a trumpet solo that was supposed to start completely different. Okay, now let's listen to it again and I'll show you a signal when, when, this, when the drummer comes in. Okay, ready? Right now. Okay, so you can maybe hear how things go out of sync and go back into sync again. And when Miles Davis was interviewed about this, 
So he had a very a great sentence. They asked him, didn't you, why didn't you want to record it again? And he said, it all comes with it. Okay, it all comes with it. He understands that the best things happened along the way, right? Let's look at a completely different example from a different field. Anybody like Chef's Table? Yeah, now there is a new season. So Massimo Bottura, Italian chef. Let's hear how he describes how he invented the, 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 the dessert that he got three Michelin stars for. Let's, li well, okay. Let's listen. Taka was like, as a good Japanese, he was ready to kill himself. I said, Taka, no, Taka is so beautiful. Don't you see? With the, you know, the, the flaboyon, the dismay, the, you know, what splash, brother. And uh, so I said, look, Taka, look, look at this, look at this. This is just perfect. So what we did, we rebuilt the same situation then in another plate with all the same elements that was on the top on the lemon tart and uh, we rebuilt the same tart that, uh, that we dropped on another plate and we create the same situation in the two plates that were <coughs> ready to serve all right so what are these guys doing two people from completely different industries what are they doing improvising and adopting mistakes and unexpected events that happened along the way well. so this leads me to my second habit that I want to share with you and I call it to catch meta moments what are meta moments I'll say in a minute let's go a minute and see what's what's the workflow we usually we usually usually do so we, we used to produce something and get something in return. Okay, we used to deliver a design to our developer and then have it developed as we designed it. Well, it, it's, there, there are many things that it's not so easy usually, but um, this is what we used to, we are a machine. Okay, same old thinking, same old results. Same old thinking, same old results. But every once in a while, we can't control it. Something unexpected happens. And what do we do then? Our instinct is to say, no, no, no. Can you fix it, please? But if we, at that moment, there is a lot of potential. If we take a step back and ask ourselves the following question, what can be the na most natural step from this point on? Forget what it should have been. What can this be? So then we get a new, fresh ideas a new wind of fresh ideas coming into our, our uh, brains. This enables uncertainty to come into our work process. And then unexpected thinking comes, which leads to more unexpected results. So actually, the, this mistake was not a mistake. It's a golden bridge to pass from, from a certain uh, mindset to an uncertain mindset. We just need to catch it. and. In research language, they call this moment meta moments. They understand that there is a lot of power in this moment. And the meta moment is defined by the gap between the trigger and our action. And usually we, we, we pass by through it as if it doesn't exist. But there is a moment, okay? We're triggered and then we immediately react. But what happens there in the middle? If we stop and ask ourselves, what just happened here? What do I see? Do you remember this movement that Massimo Bottura did like this? Okay, forget the, what's outside the picture. What do I see? Then you might see unexpected beauty and unexpected opportunity that will lead you to unexpected thinking. And this is where the magic happens. For example, Pixar, they understand this. So what they do, they change the team members during the production of a movie. So a certain team starts and then they change the team members and then they take it from there. 
because they understand two things, that best ideas come along the way, and the second, that it's very hard for us to do it. Okay, it's very uh, hard for us to detach ourselves from what we wanted initially. So obviously we're not Pixar, um, and we can't change the, our team members, but what we can do, we can think, if we were this new team member, what would we think about this work in front of us? Forget about what it should have been. What's the most natural action to do from this state and forward? And many times it makes the magic. Now, if you think, if you do this exercise and then you, you, you test some options and you decide to go with the original plan, that's totally fine. But it would be from a completely different angle. It, it would be after you learned something, after you, you entertained various options and re-chose your original option. So you, you would come back to it differently. So we can control what happens, but we can control how we react. And this is where we want to focus on. Uh, our third and final habit, tactic. Um, you know this guy? Anybody like South Park? Yeah? You remember his name? Yeah, Captain Hindsight. Let's take a look at uh, two minutes, even less. Captain Hindsight! Captain Hindsight, thank God you've come. What's the skinny? There's people trapped in that burning building, Captain Hindsight, and the fire is so massive we can't get to them. Hmm. You see those windows on the right side? They should have built fire escapes on those windows for the higher floors, then people could have gotten down. And then on the roof, they should have built it with a more reinforced structure so a helicopter could have landed on it. Yes, of course. And then you see that building to the left? Yes, they shouldn't have built that there because now you can't park any fire trucks where you really need to. Well, looks like my job here is done. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Captain Hindsight. You know, you know this guy at work? <laughs> There's always a Captain Hindsight in the room, right? When things go bad, there's always somebody who says, oh, right, the color should have been different. Or, oh, no, the, the call to action should have been completely, I told you. Um, so we obviously never want to be this person. But this element, this principle does have a lot of power if we use it before things go bad. And this is when I want to talk about thinking backwards you know these moments in the room that we're all everybody is certain that what we're going to do now is the right thing to do these are the most dangerous moments ever okay if there's no doubts no questions this is certain mindset at its best so this is when a red bulb should light in your head okay so when you say yeah this is the best thing to do now this would bring us where we want to be no, that's a problem, okay? We need to be cons constantly asking questions and being in doubt. That might, be and if we're feeling that way, there's an overconfidence in the room, and it happens to us a lot. We're over overconfident by default. So it's kind of like a solving a maze from the, from the end to, to the beginning. What, what we, this principle is about is to actually imagine that our project has already failed and analyze what might be the reason why, okay? What this does is it creates a crack in our confidence, which is usually overboosted, and enables uncertainty to enter our mindset, okay? What if this fails? What might be the reason why? And then all of a sudden, it's not like you become a genius uh, in one minute, but you do see more details that you haven't seen before, okay? We ignore a lot of stuff that, we, that we're seeing. So once we ask this, this question, we start to see more details. So I wanna share with you uh, one time that this was extremely powerful and extremely helpful. Um, I had a project that I made with an e-commerce company and they have a famous product that is already successful globally. And we worked 10 months on a redesign, complete UX redesign for the entire product. And 
towards the end, towards the final meetings, they brought um, uh, advisors from abroad and very smart people uh, and very talented. And towards the one of the final meetings, I asked the group to do this exercise. Let's imagine we launched the new design and it failed. What might be the reason why? And the head of uh, user experience stood up and he said, it might fail because the registration form is just too long. Wow, silence in the room. We were embarrassed. You know, so many people, 10 months working on making all the features inside and so excited about it, but not even realizing the door is locked. Nobody can come in. There were more than 10 fields in the registration form. And what this led us to do is to think about a completely new approach. We removed the registration altogether and we created an experience where people could jump right in and use the product. And while they were engaging, we triggered uh, just small questions. Do you wanna know when somebody replies to your comment? Just give us your email. A week later, why don't you add a, add a username? A couple of days later in the right context, why don't you upload a photo? And we were creating the user profile gradually as people were using the product. Now, it's pretty funny to think that we worked on it for 10 months and what they wrote on in TechCrunch and all the blog, uh, and, and all the tech blogs was about this. Okay, this ended up being the innovation of this entire redesign. And it just came at the end using this question. Imagine we, we failed and let's think backwards and see what we can do differently. Krishnamurti, the Indian philosopher, he has a sentence that says, a confident man is a dead man. And I say, a confident brain is a dead brain. So what we wanna do here is break the confidence, control slightly in order to let uncertainty come in the process. And all of a sudden we, th we see new options. Um, you know, this entire, this entire uncertainty thing is not my invention. People have been using it for a very long time. David Bowie, he, his superpower is to write songs, right? But he knows that in order to write a genius David Bowie song, he needs to put him pl his pl himself in places he hasn't been before and create tension. So he, he imposes a hardship on himself to reduce resources in order to be more creative. Donna Tartt, an amazing uh, um, American author, she wrote The Goldfinch, which is an amazing book. She says she doesn't know even what the story is. She discovers the story along the way. She discovers her winning features along the way. She just goes along with it. You know, there are so many tools that are being discussed. I'm starting to wrap up. Um, and there are endless methodologies and tools and uh, trends and they all discuss about tools, but nobody is discussing, or not enough people are discussing, what do we feel when we work? Because we might use the best tool, but if we're not in the right emotional state, if we don't know how to deal with uncertainty and to catch these mo special moments, we will not get the, most, the, the best potential out of those tools. So how do we feel when we work? And if there's one thing I want you to take from today is that next time you feel this burning feeling in your stomach that we, we try to avoid so much, uh, just remember this one thing, that uncertainty is creativity. We've been misinterpreting this feeling as something negative, but it's not. It's actually a green light telling us you are in a zone of potential. Now is your time to shine, right now. So this is actually, uncertainty is actually how creativity feels. And if we're not there, we're probably on autopilot. Now I know it's not easy, and in many times it's counterintuitive, but if we'll be able to limit our superpower in order to enable ourselves to improvise our way out, if, we'll be, if we will be quick enough to catch those meta moments and brave enough 
to think backwards and to imagine even a potential failure and see what we can do differently, then we can create for ourselves new circumstances that enable us to be even more creative. Thank you. Thanks.